Now, the rest of the story. A hundred years ago, Gorin, Missouri, was a fly speck on the map of the Midwest, up in the northeast corner of the state between the Fabius and Wyaconda rivers. The population of Gorin almost doubled when the Miller family gave birth to a dozen children, and they worked the wheat and cucumber fields of their farmer parents, were reared staunch Methodists dedicated to hard work, obedience, temperance. As his daughters matured, Mr. Philip Miller's rigid standards were applied to any young men who came courting. Well, Lily chose well a promising young local named Loring. He already owned his own hardware business. But the middle daughter, Arabella, well, she fell in love with, of all things, a Presbyterian. And his name was T.C. Schneble. Theodore Carl Schneble. He was utterly unsuitable for daughter Arabella, had no prospects, and, as I say, was a predestination Presbyterian entirely unworthy of the Miller family's Methodist tradition. And what did he want to do with his life? He had a wild notion about some distant place out west, which he insisted was the most magnificent location in all creation. On Arabella's 20th birthday, despite her father's unforgiving resistance, she married T.C. Schneble, and in 1897, more than a hundred years ago, they rode off into the sunset together. Mr. Miller, pleased with daughter Lily's choice of husbands, shared the family home with them, while Arabella had to run away with a worthless dreamer and was disinherited. But this is the rest of the story. The last century had just begun when those newlyweds homesteaded between the spectacular red rock walls of their new canyon home. It was 1902. All ties with her family back east had been severed, but Arabella set out to make a new life for her would-be rancher husband in a beautiful no-place which they named for themselves Schnebley Station. In the century since, T.C.'s Heaven on Earth has attracted an inevitable migration. Today, the splendid canyon walls shelter sumptuous resorts. Grand homes line the creek bank. There are galleries and festivals and tourist tours through ancient ruins, including the first stone house built by T.C. and Arabella more than a hundred years ago. By the way, the settlement the newlyweds christened at Schnebley Station is no longer called that. You see... When civilization arrived, the post office said that name was too long for its cancellation stamps, so the emerging city was given Arabella's other name. Her full maiden name was Sedona Arabella Miller, and to this day, her Arizona mountain home is called Sedona. Oh, you remember how she was disowned by her family in Missouri for running away to nowhere with a man of another religion? While back home, her sister Lily had married a prosperous hardware man. The hardware man, trying to live up to the family's high hopes, got in a hurry. And for embezzlement, he ended up in San Quentin prison. And his wife Lily, four generations ago, died in anonymity. While her runaway sister Sedona lives forever. And now you know the rest of the story. And now the rest of the rest of the story. Sedona Arabella Miller's mother, Amanda, made up the name Sedona. She said she just thought it was pretty. Throughout her lifetime, friends and family called her Dona. As Mr. Harvey explained, Dona's older sister Lily married a man called Loring who owned a hardware store. That was okay with Dona's father, but wait a minute. T.C., everyone called him Carl, the man Dona fell in love with also sold hardware. Dona's disapproving father called Carl a dreamer, which he certainly was. What's wrong with being a dreamer? In 1899, Carl's brother Ellsworth moved out west for health reasons. He bought a homestead in Oak Creek Canyon in Arizona Territory, and Ellsworth began teaching at the first school in the canyon. Now notice I said Arizona Territory. Arizona became a state in 1912, 13 years after Ellsworth homesteaded the land. Ellsworth quickly realized that he was in over his head. 
With his teaching responsibilities, he was unable to keep up with his farming. He wrote to Carl and described the beauty of his new surroundings, and he also mentioned the opportunities that such a place offered. The purpose of his letter was to invite Carl and Dona to join him, an invitation they eagerly accepted. When Carl and Dona arrived in Oak Creek Canyon with their two children, they must have been amazed by the beauty of Oak Creek Canyon. I can only imagine that they were stunned when they saw the huge red sandstone formations which appeared to glow in brilliant orange and red when illuminated by the rising and setting sun. Once they caught their breaths, Carl and Dona built a two-story home. They rented out rooms in their home to passing tourists and to those like Ellsworth who came to improve their health. When the rooms filled up, they rented out tents in their yard. Like a hostess in a modern bed and breakfast, Dona cooked, cleaned, and took care of the guests. Remember, Carl was a hardware salesman in Missouri. He also sold staple items from the back of their home. In 1902, Carl received the commission to be the postmaster at the settlement. He opened the post office in the small store in the back of their home. It was common at the time to have post offices in stores. It just made sense. There was nowhere near the volume of mail that we have these days, which gave the clerk plenty of time to assist postal customers as well as those buying stable goods. Also, people coming in to send or receive mail just might purchase something. The post office needed a name. So as Mr. Harvey explained, Carl wanted to name the post office Schnellby Station, which, including the space, is 16 characters long, but it was too long for the cancellation stamp. Carl had another idea for the name of the settlement, Oak Creek Crossing. It contained 18 characters, even more than his first suggestion. He must have made the most brownie points that any man has ever made when he decided to name the post office and the settlement after his wife. Sedona. In 1905, their five-year-old daughter Pearl was riding her pony. Somehow, Pearl fell from the saddle and was dragged to death. Heartbroken, Carl and Dona returned to Gorin, Missouri to be near family. Carl and Dona stayed in Gorin for only a short time before they set up another homestead, this one in Colorado, but luck was not on their side. In a short period of time, they lost their livestock to anthrax. They endured a devastating blizzard, and Carl was diagnosed with influenza. Carl's doctor suggested that he move to a drier climate for his health. So, Carl and Dona returned to Sedona. Carl and Dona had to start over. By this time, they had three children living at home, so they were unable to rent out as many rooms as they once had. Carl and Dona worked odd jobs to get by. Donna took in laundry, canned fruits and vegetables, and babysat children. Those she babysat called her Aunt Donna. Carl did a host of chores and occasionally brought tourists back to their house for an inexpensive home-cooked meal. Now, when Carl and Sedona returned to Sedona, Donna was surprised that no church had been established. Donna set up a branch of the American Union Sunday School. Donna was the Sunday School secretary and treasurer. She invested the Sunday school's money in bonds, which helped them to build the Wayside Bible Chapel. In 1950, Donna, now in her 70s, was losing her battle with cancer. Donna's final wish to her family and friends was that instead of buying flowers for her funeral, she asked that they make donations toward the purchase of a bell for the Wayside Chapel. 73-year-old Sedona Arabella Miller Schnellby died on November the 13th, 1950. On December the 20th of the same year, just five weeks after her death, work on the bell was completed. On the following Sunday morning, the bell rang for the first time and called worshipers to Wayside Chapel's Christmas Eve service and to the Sedona Schnelby Memorial Bell Dedication Service. In 1994, the Sedona Red Rock Arts Council commissioned local artist Susan Clewer to create a bronze statue in honor of Dona. On October the 1st, 1994, the statue was unveiled in front of the Sedona Public Library to much delight. The plaque on the base of the statue reads, Sedona Schnelby, 
for whom our city is named, enriched the lives of those she touched and contributed to our history. She is celebrated for her hospitality, industriousness, and her commitment to education for people of all ages. We pay tribute to her pioneer spirit. Today, visitors continue to flock to the town with a population of just over 10,000 people to gaze at the beautiful red sandstone formations. Many visitors hike or mountain bike on the hundreds of trails in the area. When visitors get hungry, many of them stop off at Sedona's McDonald's. Now, wait a minute, Brad Dyson. Why are you talking about McDonald's when we're talking about beautiful Sedona, Arizona? Well, there's something unique about Sedona's McDonald's. You know, McDonald's has the traditional golden arches at each of its restaurants, right? Well, Sedona's McDonald's restaurant is the only McDonald's restaurant in the world with turquoise arches. You see, Sedona is famous for its natural beauty and building codes were put into place to ensure that no structures, signs, or other advertisements intrude too much on the surrounding natural scenery. In 1993, when the McDonald's in Sedona was being built, city officials concluded that the golden arches would clash too much with the surrounding red rocks. City officials and McDonald's corporate office agreed on the unique turquoise blue arches for the Sedona McDonald's. The unique blue arches have also become an essential tourist destination in Sedona. Have you been there? Sedona, as Dona's mother thought, is a pretty name for a beautiful place named after a wonderful woman. I'm Brad Dyson. Thanks for watching. And now you know the rest of the rest of the story.